lot of things from those elite speakers who have come yesterday and today we have really really very good topic and great speakers again you'll be learning a lot from today and that really useful in your day to day life the topics today are very useful both in your career and life and we start off with the uh, pete hunter he is from australia and uh, to give a brief first of all it's about design thinking and what's design thinking the importance of design thinking is really huge wherever you work and also in life so when uh, indra nui took over pepsi right uh, she that it was in problems actually pepsi was really in problems and then what she has done is she has brought in latest gadgets for all of their uh, senior executives to take photographs of various designs and so to give them ideas on how to fix the problems within pepsi so she has given them latest gadgets with lot of uh, camera very high definition cameras and all they have what they have done is they gave to their spouses to take uh, camera to take photographs and all nobody really worked on it then she has hired a chief design officer and the rest is the history all the success that pepsi say pepsi has got indra nui gives that credit to the chief design officer so design has become so important in every corporate in whatever you do and especially as engineers because you create lots of things design thinking becomes very very important in your day to day life so here we have as first speaker mr pete hunter he is from australia and uh, he has worked with number of organizations like ibm and accenture so lot of other organizations as management consultant he works with management to uh, up the top line that means to improve their revenues and improve their profits that's what he works with and design thinking is core part of this and most importantly i have to tell you the person who is speaking to you mr pete hunter is one of the founding members of the first political campaign uh, organization which has significantly contributed to the winning of uh, sri narendra modi in 2013 so he is one of the key members of that founding group and from then on he has been uh, helping lot of management in various organizations in various multinationals across the world uh, to improve their revenues or their bottom line so um welcome uh, pete it's long time uh, i've really seen you been talking but uh, really glad to see you today so welcome and uh, lots of students yesterday around 5000 students have attended the session and i'm i'm really uh, looking forward to learn from you uh, and along with me all the students will be really looking forward, forward to understand what design thinking is okay over to you Thank you, Anu. Uh, pleasure to meet you. Hello, everyone. Um, Anu, I uh, was actually very humble in giving that introduction of mine. I have not played any important or significant role in anything in life; just been doing things. Uh, but yes, as uh, very well articulated by Anu, design thinking actually plays an extremely important part in your life, and it is not something which is a which has a significance only if you are an engineer or a doctor. It, every single human being right from the time the human being takes birth actually uses design thinking uh what we are going to do today is we are going to go through a few slides of design thinking it's a crash course and we will try to look at <coughs> design thinking from the perspective of customer empathy uh i hope all of you understand the difference between empathy and sympathy and when you are working with a customer if you want to solve a problem for a customer you have to really do not only have to put yourself into the shoes of the customer but you have to also think from the customer's perspective and for you to be able to think from a customer's perspective you have to use the elements of design thinking so what we are going to do now is we are going to look at what are those components and elements of design thinking and how we can use them in the business environment and also in our day to day life okay let's start so uh here you what you see here is that design thinking is equals to innovative problem solving now one may ask that okay what is innovative problem solving now problem solving in itself as a process is innovative because when you are solving problem you have to think out of the box okay you have to look at all the various um areas 
and all the permutation combinations, everything which you can think of to solve the problem. And that's why innovation comes into picture. And an extremely important aspect of innovation is design thinking. Because when you're innovating something, you're looking, you're breaking it down into pieces. You're looking at every minute and detailed aspect of that particular subject. That's why design thinking and innovative problem solving are the same things. Now, there are three types of problems, and I'm very sure that uh, after we have gone through these three types of problems, each one of you would be able to identify and would be able to relate with what is written here on this slide. In our lives, <clears throat> whether when, when we are young, you know, when a, when a child, let's say a child who's 13, 14 years old, my, my eldest son is 14 years old, right? Or even when I was of that age, we did not know what we want to do, right? There were certain things which we knew what we wanted to do. I, my child knows that he wants to play games, but he, he is not yet very sure what career he wants to get into. So these are problems and challenges and issues which every one of us faces, not only in our business life, but also personal lives. So we have tried to categorize these problems into three types of problems, which are known knowns, known unknowns, and big unknowns. Now, instead of looking at the definition of this, let's look at what actually it means, right? Known knowns are areas which you know. Just to give an example, when you look at yourself in the mirror, right? Um, you know, women and girls will try to make up or try to hide pimples. Even younger guys will try to hide pimples. Why? Because you know that there is something which exists. So you know it, right? And you also know how to solve it. Okay, that's just an example which I gave. So those are known knowns. Then you have certain known unknowns. For example, uh, you're driving, okay, and suddenly the car breaks down. Now, when you get out, if you see that, okay, there is, the, the, there is a flat tire, so that's a known known. You know, that, okay, the problem is that the car has broken down because there is a flat tire. And, you know, I have to either replace the tire with the step knee or take the tire to the to the car to the uh, to the workshop but let's say if there is a problem within the engine or there is a problem which you are not aware of so you know that there is a problem but there are certain unknowns about that problem so you have to then find the ways to solve those problems okay and then you have those big unknowns which are the biggest blind spots in our life and and trust me we come across these big unknowns every day, every aspect of our life. In these cases, you don't know how to solve them because you do not know the root cause. I give you the example of the car breaking down. You know, when I was, when I was young, we used to have those spark plugs uh, scooters, right? Okay, Bajaj Super. I don't know how many of you would be able to relate with it. Anu for sure would be able to relate with it. My dad bought, this, bought that scooter. So those, those scooters used to have those spark plugs plugs right so if the scooter could not start i knew that it has not been able to start right but at the same time i know i also knew or, or i had to go and find out the root cause of it and i found that there was a spark plug then i had to take it out of the scooter clean it up you know and and then just make it very clean and then put it back and then give it a bit of a spark and it'll start so this is how I, i've given an example of that you have to be able to find the root cause, but most of the times we have these root cause which we are not aware of, because of which they become blind spots. Now, blind spots are a lot of opportunities. You know, what you see here is a person who's not able to see. Now, if, you, if I were to ask you guys for five seconds to close your eyes, right, and just close your eyes, you don't know what's happening. Right. So you are also in a way a, not able to look at opportunities. You know, it, it's, a, it's a saying that when opportunity knocks, knocks your door, keep the door open. Right. So blind spots are those areas which you're not able to look at. And they are the sweet spots for innovation. Because once you start looking at them or when you are not able to look at them, that's where you are not able to think beyond. Right. Taking on a larger point of view by engaging in conversations with your customer. I do a lot of consulting, a lot of consulting I've been doing with a lot of organizations, uh, whether it is in the US and Brazil, in Dubai, in Australia, and everywhere something, and this is something which I had learned uh, in the early years of my career, 
whatever, whenever I go to a customer, right? I do, I, I, I engage with them in a conversation, right? I, I probe them. I ask them a lot of questions. I try to find out what they are thinking, what, what is the viewpoint they are looking at, right? And once we have been able to understand their view, it will help us to understand what could possibly be the root cause of their problem. So you have to be able to engage your customer or your stakeholder in an, you know, something which I call the four I process, then intelligent, interesting, informative interaction. So when you are doing that interaction, you need to be able to uh, stimulate their interest, their, their, their intelligence, right? So that they're able, they're able to share their ideas with you and of a topic which is of interest to them. And it's an interaction, which, is, which means it is not a one-way traffic. Now we've spoken about these three problems. However, not all these type of problems are best suited for design thinking. And I'm sure a lot of you would have already figured uh, about it by now because for example, if something which you already know that how to solve it, I know that I have a problem that I'm feeling hungry right now. And I also know how to solve it is that I've got to eat something, right? I don't need any design thinking, but I may need design thinking while I have to cook for something which I want to eat. Same is the case in any other area wherein you know, but you also know how to find the ways to solve the problem. But the big unknowns, the sweet spots of innovation, wherein you do not know how to solve them because you do not know the root cause are the main areas of design thinking. Now, let me again give you some examples. These slides give you an example. Let's say you're a, you a pilot, right? And you are uh, up in the air, right? And I'm sure most of you know that in today's technologically advanced world, more all the planes, when they are flying, they are on an autopilot mode, right? However, let's say bad weather strikes, okay? So what would you do in a bad weather if the bad weather strikes, right? The activity which you will do is you will execute and implement. So what is the execution and implementation you will do? You will switch off the autopilot because you want to be able to take control of the airplane, right? And what's the mindset? So even if the pilot is an, an engineer and is a trained pilot, there will be a checklist of activity with a tick in the box, right? And it will say, if this happens, do that. If this happens, do that. You will have to have that mindset of having a logical thinking that, okay, if this is what is happening, then I need to do it. So that's the mindset which is required for known knowns. And this is very common, known unknowns, right? Smartphones, as long as, you know, as much as they are a boon, they're also a bane, you know? Uh, your smartphone has broken down. Now you are thinking, okay, you know that the smartphone has broken down, but what is it that could have caused that smartphone to break down? Why has it happened? Okay, so what is the required activity you will do? A lot of you who are watching this right now could be engineers, could be software developers. And when you are developing a software, you do a lot of testing, right? So you will have to test, you will have to search, okay? When you are testing, searching, you will come up with certain, certain uh, you will identify certain items. Then you have to sort them, okay? Out of these five areas which I've identified, there are these two or three, which are the main reasons because of which, and then you have to solve it. The thinking which it requires you to have for you to be able to solve a problem which, is, which falls in the category of known unknowns is analytical thinking, because you are doing a lot of analysis here, right? You're looking, you're testing, you're searching, you're, you're filtering out, and then you are saying you, are, you have come down from 10 to five to two, and then you say, okay, these are the two main reasons, and let me solve. So that's the, that's the analytical thinking you are doing. Then comes the most important aspect, which is the big unknowns. Remember we spoke about the, the blind spots of innovation. Now, let's say you, are, you have gone to a supermarket, you've gone to Big Bazaar or any other supermarket and you, you're just strolling across the aisle there and you are just looking around at the products uh, there, but they're, ca they're capturing your attention, but you're not buying them, you're not doing anything, right? Now, you know that the products which are there on the supermarket, they have been kept there so that customers can buy. But at the end of the month, when there is an analysis of sales data and the product sales data analysis has been done by the particular store or the supermarket, they realize that there is a particular product or there are these five products which have not had many sales. 
in comparison to other 15 products. So why is it that those, 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 those products are not being sold? Okay. So the customer is no, ignoring the product. So you need to be able to understand as to why. And these are the big unknowns, which is where the activity which you require to do is you need to be able to immerse yourself and engage. Now, these could be big words of immerse and engage, but what it means, I will take you back to what I was telling you about interacting with your customer, right? To be able to have an, an engagement with the customer, whosoever is your stakeholder. When we talk about immersion and engagement here, what we are trying to say is, you need to be able to think from a customer perspective, right? So put yourself, go to the aisle, go to the supermarket. If you are the designer of that supermarket or you are the merchandiser of the supermarket who's putting the product in a particular, who's stacking the product in a particular manner, go, okay, there and see why. If I'm the customer and if I'm walking down the aisle, why am I ignoring the, 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 the product? So that's how you immerse yourself. That's how you engage. And this is where the mindset is of a design thinking because it is not a linear mindset, right? You are taking a lot of data and you are interacting with that data. All the data, multiple data is marrying with each other. And that's where design thinking comes into picture. Let's now look at three major steps to create business value. Now, I hope by now you have understood uh, what we, we, we spoke about in terms of the three different types of problems which we have and how we have categorized that. There are three major steps to create business value. Explore, test, and execute. Now, what, what is written here is invent the future. Discover unmet needs of your customer and unsolved problems that he wants solved. Collect insights through immersion and observation. You know, in sales, in, in early careers of my sales and business development career, I learned one thing that if you want to be good in sales or if you want to be good in anything, right? You have to be able to either identify a need, okay? Or create a need, right? If you are able to identify a need, that also requires thinking from a design perspective as to what is the need and you are able to identify, it requires you to immerse into it. But more importantly, if you, are, if you have to create a need, those are those needs which are, unsolved problems, okay? Most of the time, the customer may not even know that those problems exist. So you have to explore and you have to collect insights. One of the examples of insights I just gave you is that you go and make yourself as a customer and walk down the aisle, right? On the, uh, in, in the supermarket. The second thing which you do is test. Now, what, you have identified it. Now you want to test your ideas and hypothesis, right? you will create a customer, you will create a prototype, okay? And you will try to put that prototype into the market in front of the customer, and then you will see how is the customer reacting, right? How the customer is adjusting and responding to that, right? And then you will adjust based on the reactions and the feedback and the responses you are getting from, uh, from the customer. It's like, you know, in today's world, we are talking about Scrum, Okay, if, if a lot of you are uh, software students, you would know what a scrum uh, methodology is in comparison to a very linear uh, SDLC, which is a software development lifecycle. So you test the problem, okay? And then you adjust it. So you are continuously looking at it and adjusting it. And then you do execute. After you have created the prototype, you have taken it uh, to people, just to give you a live example, and I'm sure you would have heard of it and you would have also maybe read it somewhere in a lot of books that people say that when you want to build your own business, if, whether it is a product business or a service business, first you need to test that idea with your own friends, your family, your close ones, right? Because they are the ones who will be more open to, to receive your ideas and your thoughts and give the feedback to you. After you have uh, kind of tested the prototype with your friends, families, and acquaintances. Then you come back, you adjust it, and then you start executing, which means that you start building the product or the service and you bring it to life. And then you look at, okay, what are the activities which I need to do? You look at it from a business plan perspective. Okay, these are the activities which I need to, uh, to conduct. What are the capabilities I have? Do I have all those capabilities or, or do I not have the, all those capabilities? If I do not have those capabilities, 
what resources do I need for me to be able to build those capabilities? Sometimes you have capabilities, but you still need resources to be able to execute those capabilities. Now, once you identify this, this will help you to give the life to the product. Something which was a prototype till some time back, today has become a commercialized product, which has a commercial value it, to it, right? Which is why businesses exist. So we spoke about explore. An aspect of exploring, as I mentioned, was reframing the business problems to customer-centric opportunity spaces that drive value, okay? What this sentence means is you need to be able to go to the customer, understand, ask questions, do probe, 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 as much probing as you, as you can, and then put your ideas onto it, reframe them, but always keep the customer at the center. You know, when I say that you go to the aisle at the shopping center, you're keeping customer at the center and you're trying to understand. Okay, and based on that, you do inventions and you drive value. Let's now look at the, the aspect of exploring, okay, how to identify real problems, okay, which is what exploring tells us. And the, the outcome of an exploration is not only to uh, go and get a huge uh, treasure, you know, it's not a treasure hunting, but also it, 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 it results in a lot of problems which you did not know about in the past. What you see on this slide, the first reaction when you get from this slide that, okay, you are so confused. You're like, it's too overwhelming because there are too many products into this, right? And you don't even know which all <laughs> these products are, okay? And at the look at it, at, on the onset, when I look at it, they're not even related. You got, you got women heels, boots, and then you've got shoes, right? There are so many products which could be useless. Do we really need useless products? And in order to avoid building products and services that nobody will use, you will have to solve real problems. Again, going back to the same example of the customer not giving attention to your product in the aisle of the supermarket is a real problem, right? If the problem does not exist, the solution becomes meaningless. If something is not broken, why to fix it? You will only fix something. You will use quick fix to fix something only if something is broken, right? But if something ain't broken, there's no point fixing it, right? So you have to really <laughs> identify the problem, okay? Find out what is it and then make a solution for it. Now, who does not know, uh, you know, this, this great man who is considered to be one of the biggest and the most genius personalities ever existed uh, in the history of mankind. And very interesting quote, which he has mentioned here, is that if he, if someone were to give him one hour to solve a problem, saying that, okay, hi, Albert, this is what the problem I have. Albert said that, okay, I would be spending 55 minutes thinking about the problem and only five minutes thinking about the solution. Now, most of the time, yes, it is true that we say that in life you should think and you should talk about solutions, but if you do not understand the problem enough, if you have not immersed yourself, if you have not done a deep dive into the problem, how would you get a solution? It will be a quick fix, but not a solution. So you need to be able to really, really understand the problem deep down and immerse and engage yourself from a customer centric perspective. So identify the root cause of your problem, right? Customers ignores my product in the store. Why? Why does he ignore my product? So you need to be able to think and ask a lot of questions. Take an example. There is a you know, bag of ice cubes. So the customer is ignoring that bag of ice cubes. What could be reasons for ignoring those bag of ice cubes? Does he not need ice cubes? Or is it that the ice cubes could vet his existing products, his bag that he has, right? So you need to be able to come up with a lot of ideas, okay? A lot of reasons. For example, she doesn't like, the customer doesn't like buying ice cubes. Maybe she, she, she has other products in her bags and she's thinking that if, he, if she buys the ice cube and put the ice cube bag in her bag of, of other products, it may make other products wet, right? The other products may get wet. 
it affects other products and she doesn't want to do that because she may have other pricey products who are more dearer to her heart and she's like okay i don't want to buy this okay or she doesn't want to pay for products in wet packaging so what what we have done here is why 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 maybe she only wants to pay for quality what could be the reason so you need to be able to go deep down into this and look at what what is the root cause of that problem right countermeasure position ice cube bags at the register to be sold after walking through shop now think of it how come you have been able to come at this countermeasure when you looked at all those five whys then you started thinking okay she doesn't want the ice cube bag to make her other products or other product other bag wet so what we will do is that we will put the ice cubes back at the end of the store when she comes to pay when she's already bought everything she's got her bag she picks up the ice cube bag and walks away so she does not have to carry the ice cube bag in her bag and walk around the entire store which exposes her other products so that's the countermeasure you have come up to after looking at various whys now this is the five why method which is a perfect warm up for design thinking number 1 helps to dig deeper into the problem of a user experience you know again same example until you experience the user and the customer you will not be able to understand so design thinking will help you dig deep right iterative questioning to explore cause effect again all those five questions which we put in so what's the cause what's the effect the cause it the cause is that okay the ice cube bag has ice which could melt and the effect is that the customer does not want it to spoil it to become a reason for spoiling her other products right looking for the root cause and of a problem and five iterations are typically enough to provide anticipated insights so design thinking helps you with identifying the root cause of a problem and that's what it's called that's why it's called customer empathy right let's look at three shortcuts to customer empathy and i'll quickly go through this immersion observation and engagement so immerse yourself in the experience of others i've already given an example of that observe what people do probably you could go to the uh, to the supermarket and start looking at how other customers are behaving on that store and pick up clues cues from that and capture what people say they do for example the example which i gave is to engage and immerse only one rule applies here engagement should take place in the real environment you can't be sitting in a closed environment in a in a meeting room and having that engagement done okay and you would be able you should be able to make people feel comfortable while you're documenting and often the observation and capturing is not the same which is where we get confused now this is what we wanted to talk to you about today and uh, i hope you have enjoyed and you have taken certain tidbits and learns from it back to you anu can't hear you anu okay thank you so much uh, pete and uh, the examples that you have taken really made it so simple to understand design thinking I understand because the time is just half an hour you just covered the explore part of it and there are certain other part of design thinking will definitely take your help to understand the rest of these uh, topics in the coming uh, months maybe we want to do these more often so i will take your help to do this thank you so much for taking time out of this and what time is it now for you oh uh, it's 7 o'clock in the evening okay have a nice evening thank you so much from on behalf of all of our students thank you very much for having me have a nice one take care bye bye okay students uh, hope you have understood you know it's design thinking is not nothing but problem solving in a structured way and we have covered one part of it and uh, for design thinking there is a course starting from july 25th as part of the center of excellence black box center of excellence uh, it, it will be it's, you know whoever has registered for this session will be sending you information related to the course it's really very good and very valuable for you to do a small course related to design thinking and have it on your resumes because companies and corporates especially value design thinking a lot okay so we will move on to our next speaker for the day
and it's rajit rajit uh, is uh, currently uh, located in, uh, uh, in 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 san francisco um, one second so rajit is currently worldwide head for digital platform uh, digital platform partnerships and revenue operations uh, for across americas asia and middle east at inmobi and uh, prior to inmobi rajat spent around 14 years in telecom world designing launching and deploying next generation mobile and advertising solutions for telecoms in major telecom industries in usa israel israel and asia and the time is around 2 am for uh, rajat now Uh, sorry to disturb during this time, uh, Rajat, but and thank you so much for accepting to speak to the students. Uh, students, he will be talking to you now uh, how to design Internet of uh, IoT tools. So I am. Um, so he is uh, both technical and a business person. He will bring a complete perspective, a 360 degree perspective of how to design IoT tools. So welcome, Rajat. Thank you so much for uh, agreeing to speak on to this. And over to you. Thank you, thank you, Anu, so much. Uh, am I audible? Okay. You are audible. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. And thank you very much for having me here as well today. Uh, this is a very interesting topic, and I think I was just listening uh, to Pete as well before uh, before my session. Some of the very interesting things that he brought up are uh, stay very relevant, and they have really passed the test of time. If you look at any design system, whether it was a legacy design system or new systems that we are designing now, there are a couple of aspects, especially around humanizing, around empathy, uh, around use case creation, which which are more like uh, you know golden rules uh, that will stay foundationally. Though a lot of things around the implementation or the how and the why change. My attempt today is to take you through one of the most pivotal technology disruptions. that has happened around us which was internet of things i think the only this is the third large disruption that we could see in the modern history after the industrial revolution we really had the uh, digital revolution which was the computers and then internet and i think the third revolution that we are seeing is the internet of things and it's also very interesting because internet of things um, was very nascent when we started incubating and thinking about it in the 4g world which is the world we live in now but as we move to the 5g world much of the internet of things philosophy becomes a reality um our attempt today is to spend next 20 25 minutes with you explaining how we design this highly complicated highly complex ecosystem which is a very important word it's not a system it's an ecosystem called iot using infrastructure that 5g provides us and how do we apply the same humanizing and empathy principles to design solutions this is one of the very unique uh, situations where you're not going to design any product it is not any system design that you're going to do you're actually going to do an ecosystem design many of you guys who will uh, find themselves um, with firms uh, with entities that are a part of the supply chain whether it's the infrastructure part or connectivity part or the application and the intelligence part you will see that the design uh takes a very different shape when you start thinking ecosystem instead of one system uh but here's a, here's another interesting thing um, being uh, in telecom and data industry for almost all my life um there is an illusion uh, that we all may have whenever we see a physical object we think that is a product for example i'll take an example of a, of a connected fridge um I have a connected fridge at home, exactly the same one from Samsung. It's a beautiful product. Uh, you, it looks very nice. Uh, it has an infrastructure. Let me let me call it that way, and it has connectivity as well. But that product is is useless for me. I really can't do anything except enjoy the beauty of the product, unless that product really provides some intelligence to me. So this is the fundamental thesis behind us designing the IoT. uh products and making them a part of the ecosystem where an outcome is identified first before we go into identifying what product should be designed um let let us let us start with uh, something more fundamental something more basic so that it's easy for for you guys to understand um 
take this refrigerator that I just, just, just showed you and extrapolate it to a smart city. Uh, the concept is, is not very new. You would have heard about smart cities uh, in probably the press for a long time. It's just a bunch of connected uh, infrastructure things together. You know, your home, your traffic, your traffic lights, your garbage cans, smart grids, security, surveillance systems, traffic lights, a bunch of other things connected together. Now think about that fridge that I showed you and think about this. First part is imagine that you still are talking infrastructure and connectivity right, which is all what you can see in the picture. But once you start humanizing that, the first concept of our design thinking is empathy. Take this ecosystem and humanize this. If this ecosystem was supposed to be a human being or an organism, the most important parts are really your brain, your heart, and the blood that carries oxygen from the heart to the brain. So what is the brain and the blood of this entity? If you look closely, you will realize that the blood is actually the data that is flowing across various systems. And the brain is the intelligent applications that are making decisions for this ecosystem. A connected building or a connected house or a connected car in itself is useless, just as that fridge was useless, unless there is a common hub that is using that data from a connected car, triangulating it with the data of, uh, let's say traffic pattern in the city, and also with some people related data or infrastructure related data, and then creating a decision that it pushes down to the car, telling it, hey, this is the speed at which you should go, or you should take a turn because the traffic is really bad at the next segue. It's very important for us to realize, once you start designing an ecosystem uh, like a 5G or IoT ecosystem, which I think by the time you guys enter industry, this will be probably the norm. Uh, in another 18 to 24 months, we'll be sitting in front of a, of a first wave of commoditization for both of these. Um, it is very important for you to humanize uh, this thing. Uh, this is the only thing that we will focus today. I think this is the most important thing. And if we can do justice to that in the next 20 minutes would be great. Now here's the complex situation. Uh, currently the digital systems that we have, uh, which is provided by companies, whether they are software or hardware companies, these digital systems can't even properly exploit the data of three, four billion smartphone connections that we have today. Look at from a, from a 3G world perspective. We have around four billion phones in the world which are talking to each other. Our systems can't even process that. Imagine can our systems process the ecosystem of 140 billion devices where everybody from your refrigerator to your watch, to your sponsor, to your car, to your building sensor, to your thermostat is throwing data and that data needs to be processed. It's a humongous problem. There are two ways in which we can solve these problems. And, and wearing an engineer hat for the next few minutes, if you are sitting in, in a control room where you have multiple moving parts and you want to make, uh, make, that, make certain decisions in that control room, the only easy way is to find the common control point, some common control lever that you can switch on or off or through which you can control all those entity points because it's very hard for you to go at each and every control lever and try to change it because the moment you change one, the other response, you change other the third response, unless you have a common control hub, it's very different. Now imagine in 5G world or an IoT world, what is that common control lever? Can we find a common control point? Because if we can find a common control point and if we can design that using design thinking, if we can leverage our humanizing aspects, our entity aspects to design certain functionalities on that common control point, we will have solved a lot of problems. Uh, and that is what we do for our living at Inmobi uh, and also our sister companies like ProFactor. We deal with these problems and solutions day in and day out. Now, fortunately, there is a common central control point for IoT. Wearing the design engineering hat, mobile is the key to the kingdom. Mobile, which was a connected connectivity device uh, a few years back, is now the control point of connecting other devices. It's not a new thing. You would have experienced that. You may have mobile phones. You would be streaming uh, videos on your connected TV using your mobile phones. You have connected watches. You exchange data, a bunch of other things you do. But in an ever-growing world of IoT and OTT, this is the one 
control point that we want to design properly. We want to be very sensitive and humane about what we can do with this product so that we can control the entire supply chain of ecosystem. Let, let's just give it a shot around 30 seconds. I'll take you a little bit down the memory lane and see how we arrived at this situation over here. Starting 1999, which was a Y2K year, 2000 to around 2012, it was a very heavy desktop-led platform market that we saw. Desktops and laptops were the things to go. And people were not thinking cross-device, honestly. People were thinking internet connectivity, my machine, let me talk to the internet, let me get data, and let me process that data. The concept of cross-device did not exist. What happened, unfortunately, during those 10 to 12 years was we had these massive legacy wall gardens that got created. And these wall gardens have been traditionally very cookie-based, inefficient systems. And there are duopolies, triopolies out there, some large, big companies that control the internet. And they have been able to control the internet because people have been able to create wall gardens, which means once you come onto my platform, you stay there as much as you want. But once you go out of my platform, you lose access or goodness on my platform. So, you know, if you want this goodness, come back again. This, this is not good design thinking from an ecosystem perspective. That is why we call them wall gardens. Wall gardens can't share goodness between each other. And because they were all traditional cookie-based hacked systems, if I may call, uh, we could never solve the problem of an interconnected world, of IoT world, which we are now today. After 2012 till 2019, these were seven most transformational years where mobile actually became the forefront of everything. Mobile overtook desktop. Mobile overtook connected TVs. Mobile was empathetic to cross device. From the get-go, when we started thinking about a smartphone, the word smart meant the phone should do much more than just allowing you to exchange conversation or exchange messaging. Uh, of course, Inmobi was born in around 2010 timeframe when the flux um, was on the tipping point. And we decided that the only, uh, only wave that we are going to ride is the mobile wave. So we became one of the world's largest independent mobile first platforms, and that's what we do for our living. We today have around one and a half billion people on our network, uh, give and take, which is a huge, huge set of data that we process today, around 80 billion signals every day, 100 terabytes of data every day, and we make it work. Um, that's why I said the power of being empathetic to a system is just enormous. Uh, what's going to happen now? In the next five years, you will see OTT, IoT, and 5G becoming mainstream. There's just no doubt about it. But still, now mobile is in your hands and it's a common control point. Let's design it properly uh, so that it is empathetic to the future that awaits us, right? So let's see how we can solve this problem. It's a very interesting uh, problem to solve. I'll keep it a very high level uh, without going too much technical, uh, just for the sake of the audience understanding. But if I'm able to convey the concept that you can immerse yourself in, that'd be really great. Um, think about this graph. Uh, this is a real graph that you see on, in front of you on the screen. Uh, this is a network signal graph. Um, in Mobi, for example, we are a, a, a mobile uh, platform. We work uh, with mobile as a technology, uh, processing various signals that come across on your mobile device. And we have a sister company called True Factor that works very closely with telcos. So we understand telco network graphs very well, and also mobile as an application layer. Now, if you look at this graph, it looks like an X-ray machine. It's basically radio signals emitting from towers. If you can make out there are certain towers and some orthogonal radio waves are there. 100 terabyte of raw data processed and ingested daily into our system. Again, go back to the first slide of the refrigerator. We have infrastructure, we have connectivity. Both are done right, but there's no intelligence. What could you do of this? You have all these billions and gazillions of raw data floating around today. How do you make sense of it? Can we design a system which brings intelligence at the core and infrastructure at the back. Let's see what we can do. As a part of our system, the way we designed our systems was we take these raw signals, uh, complex, um, high velocity, high volume raw signals, and we convert them every day into around 400 million intelligent pinpoints. So this complex network graph essentially gets reduced to what we call as a digital customer graph. So you see the different color spots. These are basically people doing various things at various locations. And you can actually see in which part of the town where people are aggregated, what they are doing, 
uh, where they are dwelling, what are their routes, what are their behaviors. Uh, imagine reducing 100 terabytes of data every day into 400 million intelligent pinpoints. points. Even from a volume perspective, 400 million is a lot of data. But for us, it's not that much because the think 5G is going to be several times more. Uh, we take it a step forward. Now we become more empathetic and to say what we can do to these pinpoints. We then curate these pinpoints and make them personal, make them empathetic. We are finally talking about people. It's all about people. It's not about devices, infrastructure, it's people who make decisions, people who consume products. So we take these 400 million pinpoints and we curate them down to around 100 odd million dwell points every day. What's dwell point? Dwell point, as you can see in the graph, essentially, is your dwell time. Uh, where do you stay? What is your home? Where's your gym? Where do you work? Which cafe do you go to often? How much time do you spend there? What is, your, what is the route that you follow? Once you go from home to office, then maybe office to gym, and while returning back to the home, you basically stop at a cafe to take your coffee or a cold coffee or a brew or a beer, what you may. This data can be put to a lot of use. This data helps us convert that X-ray graph into a digital intelligence set, something that we can associate empathetically at a personal level. So we can talk about people's segments. We can talk about a bunch of people in this area doing certain activities with certain intent, or at some other area doing some kind of a consumption and you know, reacting to some, let's say, a concert or traffic or you know, whatnot. And in a COVID situation that we are today in, imagine we really don't even have systems today that could help us navigate the COVID. It is unfortunate that you know, being a software first company for the law, a software first country for the last 20 odd years in India, we still were not able to design systems ground up natively that would take uh, digital intelligence at the core of system design, rather data infrastructure operations and whatnot. I think COVID has kind of pushed a lot of people in thinking fresh. Uh, companies like ourselves just found ourselves lucky because we were able to provide some solutions out uh, to the people in need, uh, to the communities in need. But think about that. What do you do about that? The digital information sets that you saw, the final outcome, there's a lot of things happening behind the scene. For example, we are processing about 2 billion route miles per day. Well, what routes people take uh, to go to a grocery store, to go to a to work, to go to a nearest bank or an ATM. All this helps us design a smart city better, plan traffic better, advise the governments on where they should deploy their buses, uh, wh what kind of a public communication should be set up in that particular area. We look at physical behavior of people. Uh, we look at around multiple, multiple billions of web sessions that people do, understanding what they are searching, why they are searching, is there a need of certain aspects, for example, masks or sanitizers were really in dire need in certain localities. And the supply chain is just not designed to capture that data in real time and ask somebody sitting across the border to react to that. Fortunately, we have systems um, that do that today. But all I'm saying is when you start designing systems for future, you have to be empathetic about who is going to use them and in what situation. Think about 200 million customers that we, we listen to every day on social, for example. Uh, we are able to find out themes and then overlay their social sentiments over their actual physical behavior and try to see, does it really make sense? People want to do something which is a sentiment, plus people are doing something which is a physical behavior, and that may not correlate properly. Can we create a bridge between them, which, is a, which could be a big economy of sorts, so that people get what they want, right? And again, remember, mobile is the only control point in the connected future world. So what you do on mobile becomes a, an interesting leverage point for you to move that ripple in the ecosystem. Uh, using all these data sets in the systems, we are able to create what we call as a very nicely unified digital view of the world. Um, why is this important? Um, if, you, if, you look at, um, if you look at a country, and imagine that a country was, again, humanized, just an organism of sorts. It has an input, it has an output, like we eat food, which is an input, and output is an energy, which we consume to do different things. A country also has some input, uh, which is the gross produce that people produce in the country. 
and then it gets sold or consumed and creates an output and com- a country uses that output as GDP spend, it kind of spends on infrastructure, other programs, wellness, um, um, development, it creates jobs in the ecosystem and whatnot. If we are able to make this organism work better so that the input and output are more correlated and the leakage is not there, which can only happen if you process data properly, if you design systems thinking who's the end consumer. And you may empathize saying, I want to, my end consumer should be a person, my end consumer could be a country, my end consumer could be a community. You have to humanize that person and then you can start designing the systems. Without that, you'll be basically designing infrastructure and connectivity, which in dire times of need may not be usable easily. Another interesting thing is, we have been fortunate enough till the 4G world that the entire set of connectivity as well as um, I would say computation, we could take the liberty of doing that in a central cloud. Right? You, you have seen cloud systems, which are central huge databases. They have tremendous amount of compute power. But with the advent of 5G, everything is going to move to the edge. It's, it's, it's a complicated topic. I won't touch it here. The only thing I want to say is um, 5G is all about very low latency. Uh, and very high reliability. So you will see very different kinds of uh, uh, telecom infrastructure being set up, uh, but the intelligence moves from your data center, which is somewhere up far. Let's say you're in Bangalore, your data center could be in Bombay for all you care. Your data center would actually be on the edge, which means probably 20 meters away from where you physically are. And you will get this much of a space to process all this data. Literally, it could be an SDK or just a, 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 um, a tiny board on which you have to do all these computations. This presents another uh, interesting complicated challenges to you engineers. That when you start designing systems that have to do a lot of processing and actually the computer, the space is very low, can you still humanize and can you still design those systems natively grounds up, not as infrastructure connectivity systems, but as human systems that take intelligence at the core. Um, what is the problem um, that we see at this point in time? Data economy has, has highly, highly exploded. Um, currently, an average person like yourself, like me, produces around 4,000 plus interactions every day on the network. It's huge. Every person, 4,000 interactions every day. Imagine so much of data, and we process it today. You know, much of that we process it today, and we are able to clean it, curate it. This data fuels around half of half a trillion of an economy uh, by 2025. But unfortunately, 80% of the resources on the data sciences side that we have today, they're still consumed in operational support in collecting and cleaning data and processing data and not building intelligent APIs, not building intelligence on it. It is because the legacy systems on which the entire thing stands is so complicatedly laggard that you will have to spend 80% of your time just cleaning and curating and 20% of the time of using that clean data to build intelligent systems. Fortunately or unfortunately, as we stand today, as we are looking into 5G and IoT, these are brand new systems of records. So when you pass out of your campuses, when you go out, when you start designing these systems, think that 80% of your time should be designing intelligent systems, less than 20% should be an operational system. So everything, should become a part of your native grounds of design thinking. So I'll, I'll, try, to, I'll try to summarize uh, what we all discussed here. We only touched on one aspect, which is empathy and humanizing networks, uh, because I think it, you know, it's a topic deep enough for somebody to understand and absorb at this point in time. But if you could really think intelligence instead of infrastructure and reimagining instead of just reinventing and empathize instead of engineering, I think these mantras will help you really create systems that will be very fruitful uh, for, the, for the generations to come. So I'll take a pause here uh, and over to you back. And if any questions, any comments, I'm most happy to uh, take it. I think you're on mute, Anu. Uh, yeah, there are quite a few questions uh, from the students, Rajat. And um, because mo- both yourself and the previous speaker, Pete, have emphasized on empathy. The questions are mostly on empathy. So uh, the thing is like 5G uh, and radiation. So people are saying like lots of birds, animals and humans will be impacted with the radiation. So is 5G uh, boon or bane is one question. 
See, 5G millimeter wave impact on humans or let's say living organisms is something that you have found a lot in movies and social and other places. Nothing is really proven, honestly. If you look at systems that we are currently using, which is sub 600 megahertz systems, they are very much like the 4G systems on which we are building the 5G. Yes, the millimeter waves that we are going to use in the next version of 5G are very um, uh, new kind of, uh, I would say, um, connectivity medium that we are trying to use. I think whosoever is the regulatory bodies who are trying to weigh uh, the effect of these radiations kind of can best uh, guesstimate it. If it is not a good system, definitely it'll be changed. But again, you're thinking still infrastructure and connectivity. You should start thinking what you can do once a good system of record is available, which is about intelligence. Whatever system, even if you have a fragmented system of record, can you reinvent that uh, and reimagine that? So I cannot comment on the impacts of millimeter wave radiations, uh, but I can definitely say, look at uh, outside in rather inside out view and look at what you can design given the systems you have at hand. Okay, the, the, question, the same questions are from Anvesh and uh, uh, Technical Master and Priya Mani, but there is an interesting question related to privacy. So one question uh, from Anvesh again is how sensitive the data should be in this digital world? Maybe the question uh, is- Privacy, no, it's, it's a very important thing. It's a very important thing. I think we all saw what happened in India over the last one week with banning off um, a certain digital properties uh, of China and other things. Uh, privacy should always be in the control of the user. If it's your data, you need to own it. Governments need to exercise regulations on that. There are certain legacy platforms that we have seen that float around us and we use them very loosely. We enjoy using those platforms that play around with our ability not to understand the thin line. Uh, but I can again tell you, as we enter into an age where data drives everything, like my fridge knows more about what I eat than maybe my wife knows, and it's a fact. Uh, but I have given some consent to my fridge because it's of use to me. So you will always find yourself in a balancing trade because all these things that are getting provided to you are free of cost. Somebody needs to make money out of it, but you need to be very sensitive about what data you're sharing versus not. Fortunately, regulations are much, much tighter now. Even Apple announcement that came last week, the iOS 14 launch, whereby they have removed really the um, ad IDs, so-called Apple ad IDs, and made them very, very user controllable. This is just how industry is now reacting to it. So, so your data is your data. So just, just control it. So uh, there is uh, one student, Manikanta, uh, the similar question, Manikanta, the answer you've got, he said, it's so risky developing 5G without developing sophisticated security systems. So yeah, the next question is, uh, 5G seems to be <clears throat> developed in other countries, but in India, we are taking so much of time to get 5G, 5G to us. The question is from Blue Caps. Um, I think one of the important things is if you saw what happened with the 4G boom in India, especially what Reliance had triggered uh, with the geo, we still have not exploited anything, even 10% of that 4G boom. And there's a lot of investment that has gone into infrastructure. So I think the person who has invested in infrastructure, unless they break even, it's very hard for us to expect them to shell more billions of dollars into 5G. Somebody has to pay for it. So I think we'll get there faster uh, than many other countries. Uh, but I think we are a digital first country. I can tell you that basis of what we have seen even outside. So we'll get there much faster than many other countries. Okay. So Rajat, the next question is also good. The question is uh, from Pavan Kumar, Sarikonda Pavan Kumar. He asks, uh, do you think IoT helps in agriculture? IoT helps in agriculture big way. Again, humanize, humanize agriculture. Think from a farmer's perspective. All the information that he collects uh, by gut, he can then collect that by sensors. Those sensors can intelligently advise him what to do, what to sow, when it's going to rain, what is the humidity of the soil, um, what, is the, what is the price of this food article going on in which market, and where should he go and sell it. And if the supply chain is correct and blockchain comes into picture, we can actually remove a lot of leakages and put the money back in the farmer's hand. So it's a big boon for agriculture. Okay, and there is a question from Shubham Meena. 
can IoT learn and help in how to protect our data from cyber attack? Um, see, cyber attack is just an addendum or an appendix uh, of the of the cyberization of that age. It will grow and it will become just complex. Uh, with 5G, the open loopholes for cyber attacks are probably 100 times more than what they were in, in 4G uh, because it's an open ecosystem. Anybody can just build a system and hook onto it. So the, the, the solution lies in the standardization of the security layer. And there are companies like Cisco, like HP, Microsoft that have taken some very good stance at that. They have built systems and if we adhere to those systems and specifications, cyber attacks will be very difficult. But I'm 100% sure uh, that people who write bots and codes to attack these systems are also engineers like yourself. Uh, but the criminal code of justice is now so strong that I think that deterrence stays very high for those people to try to penetrate into these systems. OK, so those are the questions. Rajat, thank you so much. It's too late for you. or <laughs> It's a time almost to wake up. <laughs> so thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your time and uh, on behalf of our students um, thank you so much for uh, this midnight session from you it's probably 3 a.m for you now uh, it's 2 30 yet but no i'll definitely catch up some sleep but thank you so much for having me i know and um, good luck to everyone thank you thanks so much yeah Okay, students, uh, uh, I hope you, uh, it was a little bit technical uh, because you're all engineers, hope you have followed the infrastructure part and the empathy part. So every solution has these two, right? The technology part and what today's speakers have always mentioned is there should be use of what you are doing. There are so many projects I see from engineering students. You yourself do not understand where it will be used. So from now on, whenever you're doing a project and submitting a project, find out who, who is the user and for what purpose it will be used. That is mostly the best part of any project that even in interviews, when they ask you questions, they will expect you to answer on what is the utility of the project that you have done. So from both this, you have to think about what you, your takeaway will be empathizing and humanizing factor of the technology solutions that you are make, making. So give me some 10 minutes. Um, I'll be talking to you about uh, the center of excellence. No, I'm not going to bore you uh, uh, with the same thing that I have repeated, uh, I have told you yesterday. I'm going to tell you some interesting things, uh, but again, I'll be showing you the slides, but I'll be telling you some interesting things uh, as part of this, okay? So we are conducting these sessions as part of the centers of excellence that we have established almost in 20 colleges or universities across the country, starting from Jammu to down Tamil Nadu and Kerala, we have these centers of excellence across the country. And with us also today is uh, Mr. Durgesh and uh, sir is from Computer Society of India. We are now tied up with Computer Society of India in taking forward the emerging technologies to all of you in, in your colleges. If you have a CSI chapter, then we'll be always there. And uh, we have centers of excellence separately in various colleges where we have already started a lot of activities around uh, artificial intelligence and emerging technologies. So what will the center of excellence bring? I, I explained to you yesterday. As I said, I promise I, don't, I will not bore you again with the uh, same thing which I have repeated yesterday, but this slide is very important to you to understand what all, and I want this these benefits to be imprinted in your mind so you can understand what all you will get as part of center of excellence the center of excellence will be bring you five hands-on connected workshops as you see and five professional certifications so we will have to see then what is this uh, connected workshops i will have to show you another screen um, okay So this is connected experiential learning. I've explained to you yesterday what is connected learning. Connected learning is here a workshop, there a workshop, here on IoT, there on AI, there on ML, and there, there on CNN. You don't have a connection. What is CNN? If you have the background of understanding of entire statistics, 
then data science, then machine learning, then CNN makes some sense to you. So we will bring that connection. Whatever you learn, you will become expert in a line of learning. Okay, that's what is connected. But what is experiential learning? Experiential learning is you will experience. It is not just somebody explains you on a board and you will mug up that one. No, experiential is you will do. You will experience by learning, by doing. You will learn by doing. So we will bring you connected experiential learning through the workshops. And you have seen the kind of speakers that we are bringing since yesterday. I'll have to give you my brief background. I am from ISB, which is which stands 11th in the world for uh, MBA education. I'm an engineer like yourself. I have worked in companies like Satyam, Vipro, and Microsoft in very senior positions. And my MBA from this, uh, from ISB, which is 11th in the world, brings me classmates and alumni who are, who are at CEO, CIO positions across the world. So that's how I bring you 800 HRs or I'll bring you thousands of CEOs to speak to you or I'll bring you thousands of internships for you to work. So these people all who are speaking are all my classmates and friends who are working as senior in senior positions as CEOs across the world. So what you get is sitting in Hyderabad or sitting in any part of the country, you are all from different parts of the country, you will be able to work on projects or on internships that will be delivered from across the world. There is nothing stopping from you, stopping you sitting in the sitting in your home, giving getting an experience and quality of education that you get that anybody will get when they study in university of say University of Missouri or University of uh, on Australia University. So you can sit in your own place, at your own home, and still get the experience of working for such premier organizations and people of such caliber will teach you. That's what we bring you. And explaining about the workshops, uh, designing and entrepreneurship will start in July. So what you see is here, there are different kinds of uh, kinds of programs you can choose. Say, for example, you are not interested in technology at all. Then choose this, choose design thinking, choose entrepreneurship, pro choose project management business analytics, Six Sigma, all these are really very, very high paid, high paid workshop, high, high paid job profiles. Through these workshops, you will be learning all these things where you will be put, in, put, put into high paying workshops. Yes, I haven't. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay. What you see here is my um, is uh, the workshops. This is experiential and connected workshops that I'm saying. As I said, these are connected experiential learning workshops. And as you see here, there are different models of paths for you. You know, if you are really not interested in programming, you can still be a very good engineer by learning all these things. They are very very highly paid. You see here design thinking, you see entrepreneurship, you see project management, business analytics, you see a lot of this stuff. This is one route where you can become expert and get a very high paid salary. And then you have domain expertise program. You can become a domain expert in one of these things. Maybe you can become expert in banking. You can exp become ex expert in healthcare. These people are really, really required. Nobody comes with this knowledge to a job. I, I myself interview a lot of people, right? Nobody comes with domain expertise and it is so much required. It will be refreshing to see somebody who can come and talk about a domain. So you have banking domain, you have healthcare, you have e-commerce and retail. So you have so many. And then at the end of the day, we are all engineers. So you need to know some technology. So you can concentrate on something like this. You, emerging technologies, you can choose internet of things. You can choose cloud. You can choose data warehousing and data mining. You can choose blockchain, you can choose machine learning. So data processing, cybersecurity, you can choose any of these things. But I will suggest yesterday also J.H. Ranjan has mentioned whatever kind of engineering you are in, whether it be mechanical or production or food processing or whatever kind of engineering you need to know artificial intelligence because just now we have seen everything is going, going to be data driven. Every small point, the next speaker is ready 
and he is also going he, he is an entrepreneur himself even for fruit de- fruit delivery fruit related product delivery he is going to use so much of data probably i'll request him to tell about it also so everything is human driven personalized and data driven so i would suggest every one of you should understand the concepts of data science or machine learning or artificial intelligence so going back to the presentation okay so what you will get is this connected workshops you choose a path you see here every student gets a career you choose a path and you become best at it and you will get a very very good high paid salary in that so it is time for you if you are in second year third year even first year second year third year time for you to choose a path and start doing this connected workshops and nothing will stop you from getting a very good very good role okay and if you have any other questions related to the center of excellence at the end after praveen sir who is already there after he completes uh, one of our director vishnu will answer some of your questions related to center of excellence or some other questions related to design thinking he will continue and answer your questions if you stay back and ask questions so as i said you will have connected workshops and then you can choose five professional certifications so totally 10 probably worth 20000 this is probably worth 20000 which you will get just for 2000 and it's not that just you attend a course and then leave it we have a social network site where you can keep working on the on the path you have chosen ask questions because the mentors the faculty will be available on that site for your questions okay so this is a connected experiential learning which you will become an expert at the end and it is role based choose a role i want to become a business analyst choose a role i want to become an ai engineer and based on it your workshop will be conducted okay and as i said yesterday 50 webinars in a year and 50 mock interviews in a year okay so you have 50 webinars and 50 mock interviews in a year so this will be conducted through our student network platform and you have seen the kind of people who are speaking to you and these will be the kind of sp- people who will be speaking to you they will bring you and take you from where you stand to 35000 feet all this portion will be covered with your knowledge okay they can speak at the industry level they can speak at your small project level these are the kind of people who will be speaking to you over the 50 plus webinars and then you'll have 50 plus mock interviews as i said this is experiential learning nobody will tell you sit about me i am anuradha i am the ceo talk like this nobody will listen nobody will like you in the interview you will have to strike a conversation in the interview that's what you will learn in mock interviews every week hrs will talk to you and explain to you how you will have to talk okay so that is 50 plus look at the value add you will be having you will be having five workshops five professional industry certified courses and that i am saying is 20000 worth i am not even sure what is the worth of you listening and directly speaking to ceos and cxos across the world 50 webinars and mock interviews speaking to over 800 hrs okay so we have this connection with 800 human resource professionals and thousands of ceos who will directly help you through our portal so you have the student network portal i have demoed yesterday i don't want to bore you again and again probably i will show you again tomorrow it's a fantastic portal don't be left behind you will have to be along with your peers this is a student network where students will be discussing what all they are learning what are they are good at even the talent okay don't be left behind because just with our 20 centers of excellences will be having 75000 students who will be talking from project level to industry level okay and um, so here you can see what are the different routes i have explained to you already through that document where we have even syllabus i can forward to you if you are interested put uh, that you are interested to receive that uh, uh, document related to all the workshops i will send send it to you through uh, email to you put it in the youtube comment section and we will send it send the document to you okay so these are the artificial intelligence internet of things and cloud computing and lot of internships as i said all my contacts or all the contacts that this organization has tie ups with the big organizations you are eligible for the internships and i want to specify 
we are saying we are we will give guaranteed internships in premier organizations for first 1000 registrations to our center of excellence so uh, there is a center of excellence registration if there is a feedback form that will be circulated to you and if you fill that that you are interested in center of excellence we will take you through the next step to uh, to become part of the center of excellence okay okay so the other one i want to tell is there will be two inter college fests and lots of fun because we believe that all learning and no fun makes you really dull so there will be lots of fun in every college where we have center of excellence there will be inter college fest and then hackathons and idea thons if your ideas are really good we can make take it to venture capitalists and make it into reality but we will guarantee you to make it into a prototype for the top 2 ideas that are selected in a year from your own college and as i said early bird, bird offerings first 1000 students who will be registering will be getting guaranteed internships in premier organizations okay guarantee and apart from that this is nothing right what you get as part of the list that i have shown you all this is nothing sorry if i bored you but i think you know nothing this is totally 2000 rupees if i have told you this is 2000 rupees per year where you will get benefit which cannot be quantified okay that is your lifetime investment two movie tickets cost will become your lifetime investment think about it okay and as i said july 10th we are starting off entrepreneurship course and july 25th we are starting a design thinking course and i want all of you to think about it because these two are are very important Uh, uh courses to be on your resumes because most of the corporates are saying have intrapreneurship that means you have to behave very responsibly think about the product so entrepreneurship course is required whether you want to start up or you want to join a startup or we want to join a corporate this course is very essential and design thinking cannot stress enough today many people have told you that and data science and machine learning starts today starts this week and if you miss this slot july calendar again it will be in july 2021 the entrepreneurship and design thinking courses will be july 21 so i would suggest because your 2000 rupees is worth the july, just the july courses and but rest of the year also you can enjoy lots of courses okay so think about it and hurry up first thousand be in the first thousand okay so and uh, be a part of the disruptive learning community don't be behind be with everybody know every know what everyone is doing know how everybody is improving and be along with them thank you so much pravin has been uh, waiting since long sorry pravin i have taken uh, eaten your 5 minutes of time uh, so i will stop sharing my screen in a minute okay all right okay so um, i want to thank you for listening guys uh, hope i didn't bore you but thank you for listening i uh, want to introduce pravin nagamalla mr pravin nagamalla is um, on uh, entrepreneur himself he has started a, an organization called fruitaholic it's around fruits i will uh, ask him to he will explain to you about his venture it's very exciting to hear and uh, previous to this he was uh, a C he was ceo of uh, indus fresh which is sr group one of the units of sr group uh, sr group probably you must be not be knowing but really really billion dollar organization in that he was a ceo and then he he wanted to pursue his own and uh, he has started fruitaholic i'm sure it will uh, be really successful and next unicorn um, and uh, his class today now is strategy for self very 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 important for of for all of us for rest of their life i have attended already his class previously and uh, every time i attend i attend i learn a point from it it's really really very important to hear for our own benefit because once you listen to him and implement in your own life you will never feel that you are working hard for something everything will be joy okay so hand it over to i hand it over to pravin pravin please uh, uh, you know I'm, i'm looking forward to this session since yesterday so you can start off the class
Praveen, you have to unmute yourself. Yes. Thank you, Anuradha. Am I audible now? Yes, you are. Yes. Thank you for the kind words and the introduction. It's been very flattering. And also, let me congratulate you for this uh, uh, pulling of this massive conclave. I'm sure the students will benefit immensely, especially in the context of COVID, where uh, most of the students are under lockdown and their movement is restricted. So I'm sure that this four-day event will be uh, enormously useful for the students. Um, I'll be sharing my screen now. Let me know if uh, it's visible. So good afternoon, students. First of all, I would like to congratulate you also to, for coming out of inertia and volunteering to be a part of this conclave. I'm sure this would be a good stepping stone for your future uh, success. So some of you must be wondering uh, what a topic like strategy for self is doing in the middle of this conclave, which is on emerging technologies. Well, the answer is very simple. Whether it is a company or an individual, unless you have a strong strategy for yourself, the probability for success will diminish. So great companies don't become great because of great products. Just because they have great products, they, can, they don't uh, automatically become great. So they become great because they have a strong strategy to deliver these great products to their customers in the most efficient and effective manner. Likewise, individuals might be having great ideas and a lot of knowledge, but unless they have a strong strategy to implement that knowledge into something actionable, success is very, very unlikely. <clears throat> also, I understand that most of you uh, are engineering students and you might be at crossroads as to what uh, you would like to do in the coming years, what should be your career choices, if you're getting into jobs right away, what kind of jobs you should choose, etc. So this session might give you some frameworks which will help you uh, decide on what should you uh, what should you choose next. Today we'll look at some uh, simple frameworks, simple yet very fundamental frameworks for realizing our life's vision and long-term goals. This is also important because unless we have a strong strategy, whether it is an individual or a company, we will not be able to realize our goals and realize our vision. And also, if we don't have a strong strategy, we will not be able to withstand unpleasant situations like uh, the current pandemic situation or any other unpleasant socio-economic or cultural uh, you know, difficulties. <clears throat> So these frameworks, which you're going to see, there would be about five of them. Most of the frameworks are uh, from my own experiences, or some of them are synthesized from some of the best books and uh, movies, and also the various conversations I had uh, with industry ex uh, ex uh, experts in the last 20 years. So by the end of this session, um, if you pay attention, you will get answers to three fundamentally important questions. First one is how to choose the right professional or business career. Right? Some of, some of you might be lucky enough to have clarity on this, but some of you may not be lucky enough to have clear uh, approach for what should be the professional career or what should be the career path you guys should take. And the second most important question we're going to address is what actually constitutes a successful career? Because there's so many definitions and opinions around what success means. So we'll try and demystify this simple concept called success. And we also try to understand how to be effective and excel in our chosen career. So by the end of this session, I think we'll be able to fairly and adequately understand uh, some answers and frameworks which will help us you know, uh, resolve these three questions. The, <clears throat> so let's start with the first framework, which is called the right pursuit, because whether it is a business opportunity you are pursuing or whether you are taking a career path, it is extremely important to um, pursue it right. Meaning the reasons for pursuit should be right. You should not pursue a career or a business opportunity just because others are pursuing or probably because your parents have advised or teachers advised, or even uh, I would say that you should not listen to uh, people like me who would be giving advices. 
and there's a fundamental reason for that a whether it's parents teachers or professional like professionals like us it is impossible to know everything in this world and b it is impossible to understand what is important for you and what your aspirations are therefore while you would hear to all the advisors from parents and teachers and friends because we're all your well wishers ultimately the decision has to be taken by you but then the question arises whether you have enough wherewithal and enough um intellect or a process to decide what is right for you so let's look at a simple framework which will probably help you decide what your career uh, path should be um ideally this should have been a interactive session i would like to i would have called some volunteers to participate in this but i think while digital means has some advantages like wide reach it also reduces the interactivity so i'll request all of you to take a moment and think of two things one is list of activities or list of jobs or tasks which you are extremely good at or you think um you'll become very good at in the coming years just take a moment to reflect on these things and secondly uh, reflect on the list of things which give you joy list of things you are passionate about maybe some hobbies which give you immense joy <clears throat> we'll come back to this list again later so we're talking about the right career choice right so the three things three aspects which are extremely important when it comes to making career choices the first one is what are you really good at or you can actually become become an expert so let's call this expertise the second aspect is what are you passionate about if you don't have passion not a problem figure out what gives you joy and the third thing is what is the economic return in whatever you are pursuing is there some economic return which means is there any wealth creation or value creation in what you are pursuing so the right career choice or a business choice lies at the intersection of these three aspects as you can see so at the intersection of the these three aspects that is expertise joy and economic return lies your career choice so now like i said you have made some list of uh, activities which you are good at and list of activities which give you passion and joy so you can think for yourself whether there is an overlap between these two or not so let's look at some scenarios how things would look like if these things are not overlapping or overlapping so the first scenario is something like this expertise joy and economic return or wealth creation totally disjoint so we find a lot of people around us falling in this category they're not really good at what you are doing what they are doing and they don't really derive any joy from what they are doing and they hardly make any economic return or wealth so these will be coming under the category of mediocre and losers so whatever you do you please ensure that you will not fall in this category let's look at another scenario so there's a lot of expertise and you also get joy but there is no economic return there's no wealth creation for example uh, if you are extremely good at bike racing and it also gives you immense joy but if you are not in a position to create economic return return from this activity or if you if you are not in a position to create any wealth out of this activity then you should reconsider it so it's better to keep it as a hobby rather than uh, as a career choice i'm not saying that bike racing or activities like that cannot become career choices but you need to uh, figure out a way to convert that into a wealth creation activity for example uh, you can pursue automobile engineering as a career choice or maybe you can become a automobile or a bike expert and create your own content and open your own channels on the uh, on whatsapp on youtube or on facebook etc or you can open a garage because you love bikes and you have expertise in them and you enjoy working on them so if you can't do any of those things okay if you cannot create enough economic return better keep it as a hobby and pursue some other um activity as a career choice where there is proper overlap between expertise joy and economic return let's look at another scenario <clears throat> so there's a lot of overlap between expertise and economic return but there is no joy we find a lot of uh, successful it professionals in this category 
you know they are very good at their job they work in large mncs they make decent money but they really not enjoying because they don't see a identity for themselves so if you are in this scenario probably you'll make a lot of money but you'll not enjoy and eventually it will lead to a burnout so that's the reason why we see a lot of it professionals after 3 uh, 4 years or maybe sometimes 10 years of their career they look at other alternative avocations like maybe some are getting into farming some are getting into social services some are getting into environment conservation etc etc let's look at one more scenario so you are deriving a lot of joy and you're also getting some decent wealth in what you're doing but you don't have expertise i would say that you are just lucky and it is not sustainable so if you happen to be in this scenario you better cultivate skills pick up skills and sharpen your skills and build expertise so that you remain sustainable now by now you must have uh, understood how the circles or these three aspects overlap in when it comes to successful people right there would be a very very nice overlap between these three aspects so people who are successful they are good at what they do uh, better than most average people they are passionate about they what they do or at least they derive a lot of joy from what they do and they create a uh, handsome wealth for themselves and for the companies they work for and sometimes the society also right and when it comes to most successful people let's say successful actors or successful sportsmen or successful artists or academicians you can imagine how the overlap is they overlap almost like a single circle for example let's talk about our favorite cricketer virat kohli so he's got immense expertise he's extremely good at his game no doubt about it he has had lot of uh, he had broken lot of records previous previously held by great cricket uh, cricketers he also derives a lot of joy and is extremely passionate about his sport that is evident from almost all his uh, games the way he reacts on the field and he had created enormous value for the country he had uh, ensured that the ranks of the country has climbed in the field of cricket and he also created a lot of wealth for himself so there's a tremendous overlap between all the aspects so this would be an ideal scenario so for people like us we should we may not be able to uh, achieve this right from day one but we should not lose sight of this objective so the higher the overlap okay the more successful we might become in our careers so to sum up the first framework the pursuit of career or a business should be a nice overlap between expertise which can be existing or which can be cultivated and we should continuously sharpen our expertise um uh, passion if not passion at least uh, we should be able to derive joy from what we are doing and wealth creation at least in the long run so if we can ensure a proper overlap between these three things we we will be having a smooth ride in our careers so at the beginning of this framework i asked you to reflect on the uh, two lists list of things which you are good at and list of things which you are passionate about so maybe you can reflect for yourself after this session or whenever you get time on how the overlap is in your case and also people who have made already their career choices i would uh, advise you to validate against this framework to ensure to see whether the overlap is good enough or not if the overlap is not good enough i would certainly advise you to reconsider your career choices so with that let's move on to the second topic okay what is successful career unfortunately there are too many definitions for this uh, simple concept called success there are almost as many definitions as the number of books which are written on personality development and success to add to the confusion there are also a lot of success gurus which keep giving their opinions um, in various channels and that also leads to another question what is a dream job or an ideal job right so let's try and uh, figure out a simple framework which could uh, explain us what would be the key components of success and added to the confusion there is another aspect called passion now since the time uh, steve jobs made his famous speech this statement follow your passion has become very very fashionable also movies like three idiots etc etc have made this uh, concept of following your passion very fashionable but the problem is all of us may not be lucky enough to have a passion we are not born with a passion as a matter of fact so what do we do if we don't have a passion well the good news is that 
passion need not be the starting point for a great career right let's look at uh, some framework some simple framework which will help us become passionate about our job or at least derive joy from our job so what is a successful career so based on my various interactions my own experience of uh, about 20 years i worked in various companies after my engineering and mba which include the likes of itc asian paints digo sr um so based on my work experience in these organizations and i also had a couple of entrepreneurship stints and interactions with a lot of people in india and abroad i figured out that success means four components very simple components it doesn't necessarily mean money because how much ever money you earn uh, there's always a person next to you who is richer than you and we know a lot of people who made lot of wealth but still extremely disappointed or extremely miserable and unhappy in their lives and also success doesn't necessarily mean having a senior position in an organization because however uh, senior you are there will always be people who are more powerful and uh, in bigger positions than you so then what is success i said there are four simple components for success let's quickly take a look at them the first component is you will feel successful if you are very competent in what you are doing right if you are good at what you are doing and if you if you feel really good about what you are doing then you will feel better and happy second and most important aspect is freedom autonomy if you have good control and freedom over your work environment instead of blindly following what your boss says or what others dictate to you you will feel better and you will feel happy about what you are doing third thing is relatedness now we all know or most of you uh, are seeing your parents or colleagues or elder brothers 60 to 70% of our waking hours we spend at our workplace on our jobs so it is extremely important to be surrounded with people who we relate to people who we like otherwise your working life and your waking hours will become very stressful and the fourth aspect is value addition whatever you do if you add value to yourself to your organization and most important to the society there is a higher probability that you'll be happy about you know what you're doing basically it means that if you add meaning to what you're doing then the chances are very high that you feel happy about what you're doing so these four things i think um, you know will make one feel happy and successful in their careers or even uh, if they are doing any business or if they are entrepreneurs if you can achieve these four things i'm uh, i'm sure you'll find you'll feel successful in your career but the question arises how do we achieve these things so let's take a quick look the first thing is like we have studied in the previous framework it's very important to pursue it right it's very important to um make your choices right as they say a uh, well begun is half done so it's important to have a good beginning once you decide on your career choices the next step is to have razor sharp focus in whatever you do so once you have uh, decided to become a particular thing in couple of years let's say you if you have decided to become a master chef now it's important very important to have razor sharp focus and move in the direction so whatever you do should take you closer to your goal so you enroll in um, you know hotel management course you get some mentoring from uh, super chefs you uh, create your own recipes and experiment with them you can create your blogs you can create your own content you can create your own channels but with razor sharp focus try and move closer to whatever you pursue the third thing is again very important aspect which is called deliberate practice now we all know what practice means and we all also know that practice makes man perfect so what is this deliberate practice so let me explain this again with a simple example i am sure most of you have this uh, small goal uh, in your lives to become exceptional or to become very good in communication skills now let me take this example and explain the difference between practice and deliberate practice so normal practice would be if you want to increase your communication skills improve your communication skills you will grab whatever chances which come your way you will increase the number of opportunities to you know communicate with people probably you will read some newspapers you will read some books 
but not with any specific design or plan. So that is normal practice. Deliberate practice means doing it with obsession, doing it with a strong intent and doing it with immersion. So people who adopt this deliberate practice will do all of that, you know, which, which is involved in normal practice and a lot more. Probably you will not wait for the chances to come your way, but you'll grab the chances. You'll create chances. Um, you'll create chances, chances to read more, to, lo to watch a lot more, uh, you know, programs on um, YouTube. You will create chances to attend to sessions like this and you will create chances for yourself to speak in public. And even when you uh, consume content like on YouTube or Netflix or even on television channels, you'll do it with a lot more intent. You'll probably keep the headphones and immerse yourself, try to learn vocabulary, try to understand pronunciation and improve your skills. So that is the difference between deliberate practice and practice. So if practice makes man perfect, I would say deliberate practice makes man perfect much faster. So when you have these three things, when you get these things, these three things right, the pursuit of career, have sharp focus and practice deliberately, you would create something called career capital. Now, most of you would be familiar with capital in you know, uh, finance or economic terms. So similarly, there's a concept called career capital, which is nothing but you will build some valuable skills and achieve mastery and expertise and differentiate yourself so that you can sustain yourself and if you're in business you can sustain your business or your career for a long long time time to come in simple words you can become so good that they can't ignore you so who are they here if you're in business it could be your customers your stakeholders your shareholders etc and if you're in a job it could be your bosses your colleagues and your bosses bosses etc and when you build enough career capital that's when you achieve those uh, four components which we spoke of, which is competence, freedom, relatedness, and value addition. So we have uh, looked at how to make the right career choices with a simple framework. And then we have tried to understand uh, what are the key components of success. Now let's look at a few frameworks which will help us excel in our career, whatever career choice you make. So the first framework I would like to introduce is called the Quadrant 2 Life. Now, this is, uh, this is an extract I have picked up from one of the books, very popular books, which is called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. So it talks about a lot of habits, but the most important habit is this. It says the most important habit habits of highly effective people is that they spend maximum time in quadrant two. Now let's take a look at what is quadrant two. So before I unveil what is quadrant two, again, I would like you to reflect on one aspect. So you just reflect on the various activities you do in your day-to-day -day lives. Since the time you get up, right from the time you get up till you sleep, you just think of some activities which you do. It could be reading, it could be reading newspaper, it could be meditation, it could be uh, time spent on social media, or it could be gossips or whatever. So as per this framework, activities can be broadly classified into important activities and urgent activities. So let's put important activities on on vertical axis and urgent activities on our horizontal axis so on the vertical axis we which stands for importance there could be very important activities which means we have significant impact which will have significant impact on our lives or activities which are not very important and therefore no significant impact similarly on the urgency axis Activities could be with some time pressure, which means which means we need to attend to these activities immediately, or there is no urgency, which means there is no time pressure. So as you can imagine now, what we are emerging at, what we are arriving at is a simple two by two matrix, right? So quadrant one represents activities which are urgent and important. So these activities usually get done. You don't have to worry too much about it. For example, you got a call from your father or your professor, or you got a mail from your boss. 
it's an urgent activity because the event has already occurred you don't have a choice these activities usually get done but the important quadrant is the second quadrant these activities are of high impact they are very important and they are not very urgent so we got to make them a priority so i'll get back to this quadrant because this is the most important quadrant let's look at other quadrant before that the third quadrant represents activities which are not important but urgent so these are the activities uh, which are deceptive for example suddenly some notification popped up on your whatsapp or a facebook or instagram it is urgent but it is not really important i mean if you are doing something very important like reading or talking to you know or if you are in a meeting okay this is not an important activity but these are ap deceptive activities because they give an impression that they are important and they also catch your attention and more often than not we will get disturbed and look at that notification open our social media account and you know get distracted and the fourth quadrant is neither important and not urgent so these are the activities for losers it's like watching the same bahubali movie some 10th time because you get entertained or watching the same india pakistan match for 100th time so these are time wasting activities so these are typically for losers and we should not really spend time on this activity so the idea is to minimize this activities which are deceptive which look important which are actually not important <clears throat> avoid these activities which are neither important nor urgent and maximize these activities which are important and urgent <clears throat> now let's look at what are this quadrant to activities so it says these activities are of high important high importance high impact which will shape up which will shape our lives so these could be something like these so reading watching good movies watching documentaries planning for investments prioritizing workout for physical fitness and health and well being family time working on relationships personality development career development these are the quadrant to activities so you got to figure out what your quadrant to activities are now all of us may not be having same quadrant to activities for example you know going back to the same illustration of watching bahubali 10 times if your career choice is in the field of film industry or film making for you watching a movie would be for learning so that activity might be getting into your quadrant 2 activity so at the beginning of this framework i have asked you to reflect on various activities you guys do or in your day to day lives so maybe you can actually plot those activities in this four quadrants and see for yourself where you are spending maximum time so if you are spending maximum time here then you should really consider reconsider your activities and your daily plan you need to figure out you need to make you need to do lot of activities which will fall in this quadrant which will add lot of value so in a nutshell what i'm saying is you need to spend time on what matters most because what matters most matters most so spend time on what matters most the things which that matter matter most people that matter most to you and spend more time in quadrant 2 so that's the end of uh, quadrant 2 framework let's talk about another interesting framework which is called ctc versus tvc now this framework you not find in any books this is my favorite personal framework and if it makes sense to you probably you can apply it in your life also so at the beginning of the you know second framework when we are talking about success i said money is not everything money certainly doesn't guarantee you happiness and therefore doesn't mean success so this is a related framework to that it's not all about money money so let's understand what the ctc and tvc mean most of you guys uh, will know what ctc means ctc means cost to the company it represents basic salary perks allowances fringe benefits you get from the company when you're working in a company so what is tvc i'm not going to tell you that right away but i'll explain what it is first so tvc includes all of the ctc okay plus a lot of intangible benefit benefits which you cannot measure immediately the exposure which you get while working in a company or in a business the knowledge you acquire the relevant experience which you get the networking and contacts which you establish while working in a company the new opportunities which uh, 
come your way the new skills which you can pick up and the value addition which you can do so all these are components of tvc let me let me take a simple examples which uh, you know with which we all relate to you all know flipkart founders right the bansal brothers mukesh bansal and sachin bansal so what do you think uh, their focus was uh, when they were working in amazon you all know that they are ex amazon employees right so obviously they wouldn't have worried too much about the ctc they would have worried about these things because they always had this dream to create their own um, enterprise their own um, venture in e-commerce so they were working in a company which gave them exposure knowledge relevant experience networking and also a lot of other value right so obviously they would have focused on tvc and not ctc so so you must be wondering what is this tvc after all right it's very simple tvc stands for total value from company so here is the trick ctc is not in your control it is usually decided by your boss and by the company and also the fate of the company but tvc at least not immediately if not immediately in the medium to uh, long term it is totally in your control and the irony is if you are actually tvc focused you will create a lot more value and wealth for yourself maybe you will be lower you will be starting at lower level this is how the ctc graph looks like with time you know you will uh, your wealth and your salaries and your income will increase at a probably a, you know 30 degrees angle or if you are fortunate it might increase like this with a 60 degrees angle but if you take the tvc approach just like the bansal brothers and lot of other successful people do you may start slightly lower but you will make a lot more money and lot more value and you create lot more you will add lot more value to yourself to your surroundings and to the country at large in the long run so therefore ctc versus tvc is a choice which you need to make and i would recommend that you guys take the tvc approach and not the ctc approach especially Actually, the ones who are planning to get into jobs after your final years. That brings us to the last framework for this session. Another very interesting and simple framework, which I call NIJ trick. I'll tell you what it stands for. And NIJ trick. This is a prerequisite, which means a basic requirement to innovation and a lot of good things in life. So let's try and understand what is this NIJ trick. and i'm sure most of you uh, relate to this either uh, from your inside out perspective or outside in perspective let's take a look at this so n stands for anything new it could be new ideas new opportunities new products new people new cultures new faiths and anything new so as we human beings we are wired to make instant judgments when we come across anything new right our mind thinks like this anything new comes in front of us the new product or a new person uh, or a, you know a new nationalist we judge when i say judge i'm not saying that we'll kill the idea right we sometimes we may kill the idea sometimes we may conform to the idea sometimes we may criticize sometimes we may we may applaud but the fact is that we will judge the idea or uh, anything new without proper due diligence so this is a wrong approach because by taking this approach you may end up taking a wrong decision you may end up taking uh, making a wrong decision and judging it wrong so the recommended approach is if when anything comes anything new comes across you try and spend time in the i zone which stands for information you try to explore more about what has come across you think deep about what is the new thing what does uh, what good or bad it does to you experiment if it is not expensive try prototyping explore try out and then come to judgment so the approach is it should be n i j and not n j and when you do that you will avoid the huge risk of <clears throat> making wrong judgments now pay attention here this is not necessarily uh, from external stimuli it it works both ways some people get into j mode for others ideas or for external stimuli and some people uh, get into j mode for their own ideas even that is wrong you don't have to self censor your ideas you don't have to self critic critic your ideas if you have a new idea okay and if you are lacking confidence try to spend more time in information zone think deep take a deep dive and um 
develop a proper prototype, experiment, explore, and then come to a judgment. Right? So the NIJ approach, let's summarize it. It happens because typical human reaction to new ideas is instant resistance. We are made like that. We are wired like that. It's not our fault. But we can change it. So as a result, if you take the NJ approach, like I said, good ideas may get killed. And this typically happens because of our either lack of exposure or lack of knowledge, because of our entrenched opinions, prejudices, or sometimes it happens because of the fear of unknown, or we don't want to come out of our comfort zone. So the approach I'm recommending is NIJ. So when you come across anything new, you, put, you should put deliberate and conscious effort to gather information first, explore, evaluate, prototype, discuss, and try out, and then make a judgment. Eventually, you may still kill the idea, but you would not run the risk of killing the good ideas. It works for new opportunities, cultures, faiths, and new people we meet too. In fact, one of the root cause for a lot of problems we see around us, whether it is racial discrimination or religious faction, if you think deeply, you will realize that it is because people make instant judgments about things which they don't want to know or which they don't know. Right, so that's the end of this session. So let's quickly sum up what we have learned today. The five frameworks. So for a successful career, the first thing is let the pursuit be right. You choose the right path, whether it's business or your career choice. Increase the overlap of expertise, passion or joy and wealth creation. Build career capital and attain competence, freedom and relatedness. Spend maximum time in quadrant two, focus on what matters most, focus on important and not so urgent activities. Maximize TVC and not CTC, because CTC will follow if you focus on TVC. And lastly, adopt NIJ technique, seek information, explore, have an exploratory mind, experiment, prototype, and then judge. So that is the end of the session. Anuradha has all, also requested me to give an assignment uh, for you guys. So, so I have put together a small assignment for yourself. This is important because um, learning is never complete unless you apply. It's not those who have tremendous knowledge who achieve great things in the world. People who do things. So it's not about people who have the knowledge, but people who apply that knowledge and action that knowledge and do great things are the ones who you know, achieve greatness. So therefore, whatever you learn, I would say put conscious effort to apply. Whether it is a small thing or a big thing, unless if you apply, the learning is never complete. So here are your few assignments. First thing is, like I said, you plot your activities, areas of uh, the areas or uh, the options, the choices which interest you. Okay, against those three aspects of ex expertise, joy, and economic return. And uh, then you make your career choice. If you already have made career choices, I would suggest that you still plot against these three aspects and evaluate your career choices. And if the overlap is high, then you're lucky you are in the right path. And the second task is again, very interesting. You plot your daily activities into the four quadrants and identify how many activities are falling in each of these quadrants. And the task is simple. You need to maximize quadrant two activities. So that's an end of this session. Over to you, Anuradha. If we have any questions, we can take them. I, we have questions, Praveen. I want to ask the students uh, to type in the comment box if uh, this is just a test to them, if they have listened properly or not. So I'm just asked, uh, the question is, Attending these webinars is which quadrant activity? <laughs> yeah, clearly quadrant two. <laughs> Basically, anything which is not urgent. Attending this webinar is not urgent. If you don't, don't attend, you're not going to, it's not going to you know, impact you immediately. But the learning you get is immense. So attending to these webinars uh, is definitely quadrant two activity. And to that extent, I'm glad that most of you have already embarked on this journey called quadrant to life but the only advice is after this uh, after attending this uh, uh, sessions like this webinar put a conscious effort and spend more time in quadrant two by applying these learnings 
In fact, uh, in one of my sessions uh, with Geetam students, I've introduced this small technique called Apple ratio. Okay, most of your engineers, so you understand ratios well. So Apple ratio stands for application to learning. So APP in the numerator, which stands for application, and LE in the denominator, which stands for learning. So higher the ratio, that means higher you're applying. And you don't be smart and fool yourself by reducing the denominator here. You need to keep the denominator vast. You need to learn as much as possible and increase the numerator. That is, increase the application of your learning. So that could be one tool which will help you, uh, you know, apply more and more of what you learn. In fact, uh, whatever you learn, you can apply in your personal life or in your professional life. Even complicated uh, topics like design thinking, actually you can apply. If you reduce them to fundamentals, you can easily apply them in your lives. In some of the, in one of the forums, I have actually told how you can apply a finance concept of, you know, negative working capital in your personal life. So for any strong balance sheet, I'm not sure how many of you are finance guys, but I'll explain in simple terms. For any strong balance sheet, which, which determines how strong the company is, it is important to keep the working capital negative as low as possible. So how do we apply that in our personal lives? Keeping like negative working capital in simple, in simple terms, you defer your expenses and you bring forward your income, right? So that can be possible in your personal lives when you actually use credit card judiciously by deferring your expenses and bringing forward your income. So people who are working right now can straight away apply this in your personal lives. Or you can actually teach your parents or your uh, elders at home to apply this. Thank Make you, sense, Anuradha? Anuradha? Next question. Yeah. The question is, uh, there are so many frameworks and advices that students really get a lot of guest speakers. And there are so many frameworks and advices that they get uh, from many people. So the, but the actual problem is cultivating good habits and applying these frameworks in life. So suggest some methods to address this, that, that if, you, if you fix that, then the rest of the things will fall in place. So, so that's a great question and uh, interesting one. You are basically asking me a framework which will help follow the other frameworks. Other frameworks, yeah. Right? So, um, See, first of all, uh, I would like to say that uh, one shirt doesn't fit for all, right? So my shirt doesn't fit for others and vice versa. So we need to figure out our own formula in life. If it was so simple, then everybody would have applied the same formula and become successful. However, I can give you some techniques to cultivate and stick to good habits, which I follow and also some of my students followed and they saw a lot of benefits. So first technique, I would call it as increase the incentives for each of the framework or habit. Let's call it as uh, carrots and habits, which means for every habit, every good habit, there is some benefit, right? Let's say, for example, if you're working out, there's a good benefit, you'll become fitter. But unfortunate thing about good habits is that uh, the results don't come immediately and therefore you don't stick to the habit. So what I do is for every good habit, I'll try to increase the number of results. So for instance, if I, I do cycling for fitness. So, so when I'm cycling, I just don't do cycling. I also listen to some audio books or some, uh, you know, podcasts. So as a result, what happens is a, I'm increasing um, to one benefit to two benefits. If I do only cycling, it will be only fitness. But now I'm also listening to audiobook or a podcast. So that is also giving me knowledge. And that knowledge I can apply in my business, in my job, that will create wealth. I also invest in equity. So the business knowledge I gain from this podcast uh, will also help me do better in the stock market. So I've increased benefits to three from fun, one benefit from a single activity called cycling, which, uh, which typically has only one benefit. Now it has three benefits which is fitness, knowledge, and also wealth. So this is one technique you guys can follow. Increase the number of carrots or incentives or results, outcomes, whatever you may want to call it. Okay, increase the number of positive outcomes to each uh, habit you want to cultivate. Then your habits will get interesting and also uh, you'll not feel effort. Imagine you are listening to a nice podcast or a nice uh, audio book while you're walking or cycling. You'll just not 
feel the effort of cycling it becomes much more interesting so this this technique if it works for you you can try and another fundamental thing i want to explain to you is uh, keep things simple now this uh, three circles framework which you have seen in the beginning of this now if you google it you'll find a lot of complicated frameworks also but the problem is with complicated uh, frameworks it is very difficult to practice first of all understanding itself will be difficult so keep your frameworks and keep your habits very very simple so that you can practice it with ease and broadly uh, habits actually can be classified into two types the first type is called uh, energy habits so these are the habits which will keep you energetic during the day it could the first and the most important energy habit is sleeping so sleeping right sleeping i would not say early but sleeping uh, in the right manner having adequate sleep would be uh, contributing to your energy so similarly work out similarly you are uh, you know cycling walking or eating healthy food these are called energy habits if you it's very important to have these energy habits because that will give you more motivation and energy to follow the second type of habits which i'm going to tell you now which is called knowledge habits so <clears throat> knowledge habits are like attending these conferences webinars reading books watching good documentaries movies etc etc so if you can just keep do these two sets of habits and don't worry about too many lectures too many people giving too much of gyan just try to make two buckets what are your energy habits what are your knowledge habits try to keep keep them simple and for every habit you try to increase the number of carrots i think you'll be able to uh, stick to these habits makes sense anurag yeah yeah it really makes sense um the one question is the students are uh, saying like they are freshers they are really yeah. in or uh, 19 to 20 years how can we uh, choose our interest don't even know how to choose an interest yeah so so this session is extremely uh, relevant for you guys especially because the sooner you manage to choose your interest the better so you may not be having complete clarity but like i said whatever things which you have remotely which you are remotely interested in list them down and plot them in the first framework which we discussed you fig you list them you list two three activities it could, it could be as uh, abstract as video gaming for example or fashion designing or, or uh, you know cloud computing or whatever or even teaching or dancing or biking whatever you list them and then you you figure out whether that these activities will give you joy or not right if the answer is yes to these two questions and then figure out how you can make um, wealth by pursuing these activities virtually there is no activity in this world which cannot create wealth if you are expert in that activity and if you create joy from that activity right don't have to get caught in the um stereotypical uh, engineering or stereotypical it jobs and since you are freshers you are better placed you have comfortably you have 2 3 years time to actually master in these activities but you need to really work hard once you choose one or two activities which uh, you think you can become good at you should start working towards becoming really good at yeah well, thank you so much yeah true actually and and moreover one more thing is uh, you will can identify because you will be doing it faster and better than others without your knowledge you will be understanding doing it faster and better than others just keep watching what you are doing better maybe see basically uh, you are the luckiest generation because unlike my generation and anuradha's generation for you so much of knowledge is available through the courses uh, conducted by the likes of anuradha now you have heard about uh, what anuradha said about centers of excellence so it ranges from a variety of uh, fields starting from uh, entrepreneurship to design thinking to artificial intelligence to you know machine learning deep learning etc etc so you don't have to have complete clarity at this stage i know a lot of people who who don't have clarity even at the age of 40 but what is important is to have some clarity and start mastering that uh, activity okay so uh, that question was from riya riya fool 
and then uh, we have one question uh, why should we it is from c mad engineer what yeah. he is asking is why we should choose quadrant 2 over others what's the importance i guess we have adequately answered that but uh, <clears throat> let me try and answer it in a different way so when you do quadrant 2 when you spend lot of time in quadrant 2 um you will pick up some very very valuable skills because quadrant 2 represents important activities it it represents uh, had activities or habits like reading or watching good movies or watching good documentaries so what will happen when you do these things you will acquire knowledge right and what will happen when you acquire knowledge you will be ahead in the game compared to your peers and colleagues and other friends <clears throat> and the beauty is if you spend more time in quadrant 2 since you will acquire mastery and speed you can actually manage your quadrant 1 much faster let's say let me give a very basic example uh, who uh, which you all can relate to you need to write a mail right now let's assume that uh, it's a long mail which you are writing uh, mail or maybe a thesis or a or a or an essay or whatever you you are sending this to your principal okay for a publication now imagine you there are two people two kids okay two students one student who has spent lot of time in quadrant 2 who who spends lot of time in quadrant 2 and has worked on uh, sharpening his communication skills and the other one did not spend any time in quadrant 2 so he didn't spend time on uh, sharpening his communication skills right it's easy to guess for you who would do that letter better or the mail better because he's already been working on communication skills okay which is a quadrant 2 activity because he's uh, he you know he's been uh, reading a lot he's been watching a lot he's been having good conversations with uh, successful people therefore he can deliver on the quadrant 1 activity much faster clear make sense Yes, uh, thank you so much, Praveen. Uh, that that that's the, those are the questions that we have. Thank you so much. Excellent uh, frameworks. I'm sure students will start thinking in the direction. Even if you don't consciously put everything into quadrants, they will know what is important, what is urgent. So your subconscious mind already starts working on it. Definitely, this session might have brought some change which they don't realize, but they will be utilizing it in every day, every moment. Thank you so much, uh, once again, Praveen. Thanks so much. Thanks, Anuradha, for this opportunity. It's always a pleasure talking on these forums, and uh, I would like to thank all the students for uh, taking out their time. Before and you the... leave, uh, did, uh, I was off a moment. Do you want to mention about Frutaholic? Um, yeah, Frutaholic is my own venture, which I've started uh, in April, so it is yet to be launched. So. as anuradha i have explained i have uh, held you know uh, various roles in uh, various companies in the past so my last assignment was a ceo for a company called sr agrotech and most of you must be aware of this group large group called sr um, which is into steel sr steel sr oil and some of you must have seen sr petrol bunks also so i was a part of that group but uh, was heading the division called sr agrotech so that that was my last assignment and frutaholic uh, i can go on i can speak for one more hour about frutaholic because i feel very passionate and strongly about that but i'll try to be brief so this is my second innings of uh, entrepreneurship this frutaholic was conceptualized uh, when i was 26 27 10 years 12 years ago so at that time the dream was to create a fruit version of starbucks most of you are aware of starbucks or at least cafe coffee day so the dream was to create a fruit version of starbucks which means a chain of fruit bars where you get not just fruit juices but also a lot of fruit innovations <clears throat> right um so i've ran it uh, for about 3 years 10 years ago uh, about 10 stores across the city including uh, some corporates like infosys etc then i couldn't sustain the business for various reasons i had to pull back uh, pull down the curtains and got back into corporate so all i have done is basically postpone the dream to now so now i am restarting and relaunching frutaholic okay with a much robust idea and a much stronger business model because uh, when we start young okay at the age of 20 and without proper guidance 
you will think it's all about idea but businesses like i said at the beginning of this session are more about business model and strategy idea comes maybe third or fourth in the ladder so this time around frutaholic would be the first innings frutaholic and the much more so the idea is to create in fact uh, the vision is much larger so if the first innings vision was to create a fruit version of starbucks this time the vision is to get everybody in uh, everybody in the world addicted to the best food and what is best food in this world which is fruit so frutaholic this time around will offer a wide range of fruit products it would be not just smoothies but it'll also have salads desserts all fresh fruit and also whole fruits organic fruits and hydroponic fruits etc um which will be available through uh, all the reputed the sales channels like amazon flipkart swiggy zomato we are launching in uh, innings we are launching this in august unless there are some surprises which covid will spring uh, spring up but i think we are on way Uh, well on track to launch in august and this time around uh, while covid is a very unfortunate thing um we are designed we have designed the model in such a way that uh, this business model will be able to withstand lot of situations like this first of all fruit comes under essential products so it will only increase the consumption this situations like this plus unlike a uh, pre covid situation people are more receptive to aspects and concepts like uh, food safety and not touching the product no touch has become the new norm food safety has become the new norm so businesses like fruitaholic will um, have a better chance in the post covid era i cannot get really into more details at this stage you need to understand the business model well probably um, you know once fruitaholic uh, stabilizes uh Anur- anurag has promised some internships for you guys right so the first 1000 uh, uh, registrations will get some guaranteed internships so i can uh, you know take some of you interested people and people with the right uh, background and skill set as interns in fact i already given uh, internship to two students from nift for the designing part and one student from for digital marketing so that's about photoholic anurag yeah, more so maybe we can have another session Yeah thanks once again uh, and all the best to fruitaholic from all of us uh, who are in this session and uh, yeah we will all uh, support yeah you guys watch out fruitaholic it will be very soon appearing on uh, social media okay thank you so much pravin thanks yeah. have a good day thanks bye thanks so much thank uh, you guys yeah thank you the students will uh, take us to uh, the introduction to tomorrow's session which is on entrepreneurship Uh, we are ending today with an entrepreneur and tomorrow we are having lots of sessions related to entrepreneurship we will be having one chief business officer from a mobile organization who will be talking on to this and uh, talking as the first speaker and the second speaker will be from ibm he is hr head he will be talking about intrapreneurship that means how entrepreneurship will be applicable inside a corporate so he will be talking about intrapreneurship and followed by a, a short course a one hour course on entrepreneurship so it's going to be a really really very good session tomorrow and will be basis for the entrepreneurship course which starts on july 10th so don't miss tomorrow and uh, we have already seen lots of students have started uh, uh, becoming members by registering on to 